frequency licensing. These are the two words that make spacecraft developers immediately curl into a ball and wish to hide from their responsibilities. And we often find ourselves asking the question, mom, do I have to? And alas, the answer is always yes. Now, if you're not familiar with frequency licensing, allow me to expand on this a bit. In order for a spacecraft to transmit and receive from orbit on a particular frequency, they must be licensed to do so. Now, the radio frequency spectrum itself is massive, and different frequency ranges are classified for specific operations, whether it be amateur radio, television broadcasting, aeronautics, or radio astronomy. Now, this is fantastic because this allows us to do a lot of different things in both the world of science and in our everyday lives. But at the same time, there are several organizations that need to use some area of the spectrum for their particular application. And thus, all of this has to be managed very carefully to make sure that you don't have two parties interfering with each other. And this is where licensing comes in. Now, one thing you have to understand about licensing is that it is not always trivial, and it can take a long time to complete. And yet, this is undoubtedly one of the most important logistics that goes into preparing a spacecraft for launch. In fact, you cannot launch without a frequency license. And there have been cases where CubeSats have had to break their launch contract because this did not come together in time. And it's for this reason that when missions are selected for launch, it is always stressed that teams start this process early and stay on top of it. Hello, space enthusiasts, and welcome to another episode of The Art of Space Engineering, the podcast which explores the engineering behind spacecraft and payloads and the lessons learned along the way. I'm your host, Sarah Rogers, and in this episode, I chat with Alicia Johnstone, who was the resident expert on licensing at Cal Poly, and I got to ask her all sorts of questions about the frequency licensing process for university-led CubeSats. And that being said, while different uses of the spectrum require specific licenses, this episode is only going to focus on a few of them. In particular, we will discuss amateur and experimental licenses. So we won't go into licensing for governmental missions or commercial spacecraft that are developed for GPS navigation or internet. So if you're interested in learning about amateur and experimental licensing, or you're part of a CubeSat team and are going through the licensing jamboree yourself, this episode will give you an overview of the entire process. This includes documents you need to develop, people you need to work with, and tips for navigating all of this and getting unstuck when you don't know what to do. Having done the licensing when we developed the Phoenix CubeSat at ASU, this is an episode that I have wanted to do for a while now. So I was so happy that I got the opportunity to talk about this with Alicia and share this discussion with you all. Now, there are a lot of resources on the licensing process out there on the internet already, but there is so much that goes into this, and I know it can be very confusing when you start out. And given that, I know it just really helps to have the whole process and any relevant tips summarized somewhere so that you can not only know how to get started with this, but you also know how to keep up with it so your spacecraft is licensed well before it is delivered. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Alicia Johnstone. Hello, very nice to meet you. Yeah, you as well. And thank you so much for doing this with me because, I mean, like I said, I've gotten a lot of um, teams who are, they don't understand the FCC process at all or how to navigate it. So um, this, yeah, I've been wanting to do this one for a while. So I'm, I'm really, really excited. Yeah, it is. It's really difficult and it's something that people don't, you know, they don't want to get into and it's not that interesting when you're thinking about CubeSats, but it's it's so necessary, so... Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there with questions and just pulling their hair out. <laughs> yeah, the, the pulling the hair out, I think, is an absolute <laughs> necessity <laughs> when it comes to this kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I've definitely spent a lot of time like going through the FCC website and their resources and just trying to like look for the one thing that I need. Um, yeah, it's, it's really difficult, um, kind of, in trying to uh, ask them if they would, you know, put something out, just like a guideline, nothing concrete, but uh, they're, uh, they're kind of hesitant to do that, I think. They don't want to put too much down and guarantee. People, people start thinking that it's, uh, you know, if we say that they can submit it 90 days ahead of time, that we'll definitely have it done, and that's not true. So okay. that's, that's a little why they're hesitant. That makes sense. Um, 
Yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure how much the, like, I know regulations change as, as, you know, now that space is exploding and more people are trying to kind of, um, you know, get licenses for small spacecraft and everything. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm sure that's might be one thing too. Yeah, definitely. It, it always changes a bit year to year, but I think in the last couple years, two, three years, there was some big changes. So, um, it's just, it's hard to, uh, to keep up with that, especially, you know, you don't do licenses very often. You've done one and that's it. And that's, it's just a, a huge learning curve. So to kind of kick this off and before we, you know, really dive into the weeds of the FCC licensing, I wanted to explore your background a little bit. Um, cause there are a lot of places that don't have an expert on like FCC licensing. And like you were saying, it's, it's so incredibly important for just getting CubeSats up there. Um, so I was curious, like what your journey has been in more of like this, the space or aerospace sector and, um, uh, how you, you got to where you are, uh, at Cal Poly and sure, feel, yeah. feel free to be as brief or as, as broad as you'd like with this. I know this is kind of like the interview question equivalent of like, tell me about yourself or yeah, this like, who do you think you are kind of a thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, I do have a like habit of uh, digressing, but uh, um, so yeah, I started with uh, Cal Poly as a student. I was a transfer student in, um, and uh, uh, I had been in the army for six years, so I was older than some of the other students. Uh, so I, when I got to Cal Poly, I jumped right into the the CubeSat program that they had here. Um, and, you know, I did uh, different things. I didn't do any licensing, but uh, I did a lot of integration work and work with dispensers. Uh, and then I graduated and I went to work somewhere else, but then uh, a job, a full-time job opened up here at Cal Poly. So I came back, um, still doing dispenser work. Um, but as we were doing a lot more integrations work uh, for other uh, universities, so we're we're helping them get their paperwork in order and putting them in dispensers. Part of that was uh, licensing, helping them with FCC licensing. And uh, my colleague was uh, the one who did it before me, Justin Foley, and he kind of did a lot of the um, uh, figuring out how things work and negotiating, you know, what kind of licenses are going to be appropriate for CubeSats. Uh, so he and some of his predecessors kind of figured, figured that out with the FCC and with IARU. Um, and then uh, when I came in, uh, I started helping uh, Justin do that, and uh, he left for JPL, and uh, then I took it over. So um, even though uh, some other people had already done a lot of the, the work uh, to figure it out, I still had uh, quite a learning curve uh, to get going. And yeah, it's just uh, so many inputs to keep track of and uh, trying to keep track of uh, how, uh, how it all works. Um, and of course, it changes year to year. So um, that's that's kind of how I got into licensing was uh, nobody else wanted to do it. And so <laughs> I, I was like, oh, I can do this. This will be one of my my tasks and responsibilities. And at first I thought it was cool, you know, like, oh, well, I'll be in charge of this section. And now it's, it's still cool. I'm the only one doing it uh, for Cal Poly. But uh, so it's my area of expertise, but it is a, it is a pain in the neck sometimes. And uh, but I still, I really like um, working with the different universities and the different CubeSat teams and helping them out because, you know, they're, they're struggling and I can, you know, at least take that burden for them. Um, so I, I do enjoy that aspect of it a lot. No, that's really cool. Um, and I, I definitely know how you feel on the, uh, you know, like, oh, no one else wanted to do it. So I guess, um, <laughs> yeah, it, I think, because like I, I, I did the licensing for Phoenix and it was, kind of like I looked at it and I was like, I don't want to put this on anyone. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, like I'll, I'll, I'll do the, I'll do the, the licensing and spare everyone the, you know, reading and, and all of that stuff. Yeah, and you didn't have a, a licensing consultant helping you, right? It, it was just you. Y yeah, it was, it was mostly just us just trying to like starting from the basics. Okay. So we know we have to get an FCC license and what does that look like? Um, the FCC had put out a few resources that kind of went through the general process. So had to, you know, through finding a bunch of things, you kind of outlined everything. And so it was like me and our faculty advisors trying to figure it out. And then once we got 
manifested on a launch and started working with uh, NASA's launch services program, then they came in and, and helped us a lot with um, kind of how to walk through the whole process. Um, and as, especially that like there were a few times when we got stuck and they were able to offer some guidance on how we can kind of, you know, navigate things efficiently. And, and that helped a lot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but mostly I think too, what helped uh, is that very early on, I got passed to a few contacts because uh, um, there was a student who was leading the ground station at the time at ASU. And so he was talking to people from the FCC and he kind of passed me off to his contacts and um, was like, hey, you know, there's this CubeSat, they're trying to get licensed and can you help them out? And they kind of, they gave me a lot of really good stuff um, to, to get me started. So um, I, I think having that initial like introductory email kind of gave us the background we needed. Yeah, that is really helpful. And that, that's part of it is uh, just having this community that's, that's uh, always willing to say, oh, contact this person or contact that person. So it's, that is uh, one thing that uh, sometimes people are hesitant to reach out and ask for help. Uh, yeah. But a lot of the time people want to help. It's, you know, it's just part of the, part of the process for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Um, so now that we've kind of segued into licensing, <laughs> um, so the RF spectrum is, it's very big. There's a lot of different designations in it. And there are different types of like licensing that you can get for spacecraft. So I, I guess I kind of wanted to structure this interview as, you know, like what kind of licenses can you get? And then, you know, later questions can be, or will be more related to like, what do you do? Who do you talk to? Lessons learned kind of a thing. So I, I guess for, for people who are very unfamiliar with this whole process, um, can you just like quickly introduce what different types of frequency licenses that you can get for spacecraft and then kind of the types of missions that those apply to? Yeah. Um, so I think we're, we're kind of focusing on, if we're focusing on uh, universities, uh, that, that type of spacecraft, uh, your typical CubeSat, um, you're going to go through the, the FCC um, and they have Three, three major types of licenses that they do for, for spacecraft. Um, and so there's the amateur part 97, which um, I don't know how much detail I want to get into, but that's technically not a license. Uh, a lot of people just say that for, for shorthand, but it's, uh, it's technically uh, more of an authorization. Uh, and then there's the experimental. Um, and up until a couple of years ago, that's the one we were pushing the most for uh, university cube sets. And you can be on any frequency in experimental as long as it's appropriate for your mission according to, you know, the ITU and the NTIA uh, frequency charts. Um, but um, recently, um, we've kind of been going away from that. We, we prefer for a CubeSat, uh, a university CubeSat uh, check and see if you're qualify for part 97, the amateur uh, first. And if you don't qualify for that, then you would go with the experimental. Um, and that's, both processes are fine. I wouldn't say either one is more difficult than the other. It's just one's more appropriate than the other. And then there's commercial, which uh, should not uh, be appropriate for a university CubeSat, I would hope. Um, it's, it's much more difficult and very, very expensive. And it's really for, uh, for people putting up, um, you know, like uh, Planet put up a bunch of uh, CubeSats and right. uh, communication satellites. So that, that would be for, uh, for commercial purposes. Um, so if you're a university, you would focus on uh, trying to uh, see if you can qualify for Part 97 first and then um, experimental after that, which sometimes that's what it is and that's, that's fine. Um, another thing is there's all these terms that get thrown around like uh, Part 97 or experimental is Part 5. So if somebody says Part 5, they just mean experimental. And then uh, Part 97 is amateur. Okay. Um so to, you know, and maybe to apologize in advance for this question, because I know it can be kind of a headache sometimes, but so from what I've seen, and this, this actually, we ran into, into this issue too, um, it can, the line between what is amateur and what is experimental can be a little bit blurry sometimes and confusing. Um, so I, I wanted to, to kind of focus on those two for a second. 
uh, and, and just ask like, where, where is the line between the amateur and the experimental license drawn and where would it, why would it be more appropriate for you to choose one type of license over another? Um, so between experimental and, uh, amateur, um, really you should, as a university, uh, if there's nothing, if you don't have a, a government owner or something, uh, or commercial entity that's, you know, making money off of it, um, you should, uh, probably qualify for part 97. The time that you wouldn't qualify for that, uh, would be like, if you have a really good imager on board and it, uh, the NOAA, um, requirements will require that it is, um, encrypted, uh, mm -hmm. downlink. Um, so NOAA recently changed this and that's why we, we switched to, to part 97 amateur over experimental because, oh, okay. uh, um, it used to be where NOAA, uh, required encryption on all images, uh, coming down and the workaround was to use experimental license on, uh, amateur frequency mm -hmm. and you have encryption there. But if you're using, uh, the part 97 amateur, you can't have encryption. Um, but now, uh, most imagers don't require encryption. Uh, so part 97 is usually the most appropriate. Um, if, if for some reason you do have uh, something uh, in the regulations that you just don't meet, which would most likely be an imager, uh, then you'd need to go for experimental. Um, or if you have some uh, corporate partners that uh, might make things fuzzy, you'd go experimental. Um, if you, um, I mean, if you go straight for experimental, um, you're probably not going to run into any problems. Uh, it's just, um, that's, that's where we, uh, and NASA LSP would like everybody to, to kind of try to do, uh, part 97. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I think, so when we applied for ours, uh, it must've been before NOAA changed those regulations because we did have an infrared imager and NOAA required that the downlink actually wasn't. That's interesting. Our downlink wasn't encrypted, but our, our uplink commands were encrypted. They didn't require us to do. So I guess for background, <laughs> um, cause we had an infrared imager on our spacecraft and we were using only UHF amateur frequencies. And, mm -hmm. um, I think just based on the, you know, we were, we were a university CubeSat with a science payload at the time was how they, they classified it. Uh, and so we were encouraged to do the experimental license because we weren't just, just doing this for like amateur radio communications. Um, mm -hmm. but we didn't have to encrypt our, our downlink. Uh, we did have to encrypt our uplink commands so that way people couldn't, you know, um, figure out what our command sequence was and command the spacecraft to take a picture of a place we weren't allowed to image. Um, so, but, but. It seems like how it is now is, um, you know, CubeSats, whether they have a science payload or not, um, if that downlink doesn't have to be encrypted, it's better for them to just pursue amateur unless they have other encryption um, requirements and then they should go the experimental route. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's really easy. Um, even if your primary objective on your mission uh, doesn't really have anything to do with the amateur community, it's easy to add that in there. Um, just, just allow uh, amateurs to uh, receive your, your telemetry, things like that. But um, no matter what license you are looking for, you can always uh, encrypt your command uplink. That's, uh, that's one thing you're allowed to do. It's mm -hmm. just the downlink that needs to be uh, open for everybody to see. Gotcha. I'm trying to think if there's anything else specific about that. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's all. Yeah, that's all we, we said is that we would leave it. We, it, we meant to leave it open for amateurs to use and see our telemetry and, and images and stuff. It was supposed to be, it, cause it was meant for encouraging participation in the amateur community. So that's, right. that's, um, that's very yeah, helpful to know that it changed that way. <laughs> it's also really helpful. Like, you know, you're a university uh, and you probably don't have a ton of experience with ground station ops and things. And it's, it's pretty helpful to have people around the world, amateurs that are able to like spot your satellite really fast, say like, yes, it's on, it's working. You have that confirmation right away. Just gives everybody that, that good feeling. If you're not very um, experienced with ground station and it might take you a while to kind of figure out how, it, how it's going. Um, 
but it's uh, it's really helpful to uh, have that amateur uh, coordination so that uh, uh, you do get that help worldwide. Gotcha. And there's a lot of amateur uh, radio operators that just love doing it. So it's plenty of opportunity for, for people to participate. Right. Yeah, it was, it was pretty fun um, for when we were preparing for the operations phase, like we did talk to a lot of people on um, like the Setnogs database and the amateur radio community, yeah. just trying to like um, figure out where our spacecraft was in orbit. Um, and, you know, seeing all the people who would send us telemetry and be like, Hey, you know, I heard it. And, uh, it, it was a really cool way to interact with people, uh, who, mm -hmm. who were trying to, to spot all these CubeSats. So, yeah. So, okay. So that, I, I think that paints a really good picture for what path you go down in terms of licensing. And now I guess the, this probably the, the long-winded part of the, this conversation would be what the actual process is. So like once you figure out, okay, I, this is my spacecraft, it has this payload, we want to operate on these frequencies and it's manifested for a launch. Um, and I know I need to start the process for a license. Um, where do I start? <laughs> Uh, where do I start? What kind of documentation do I have to do? Uh, who are the people that I should talk to? Um, and, and what things kind of have to precede one another in order for me to, to get to the final point where I can say, okay, that from, from here on out, this is a waiting game and I, I just need to wait for someone to tell me you have been licensed. And hopefully that's before my delivery date. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I would start with um, a resource that's online. It's free. It's, it's very easy to read because it was written for, you know, like high school and uh, very, very new people to the community. The uh, uh, CSLI's resources page has a CubeSat 101 document. Mm. And um, so when we wrote it, it was all completely the best advice uh, at the time. Uh, that was a few years ago. So it's not it's not completely out of date. There's a few, uh, mostly it's it's fine. All the resources are there, all the websites you need to go to and uh, things you need to think about uh, just might not be. I think we were pushing the experimental license at that time. Uh, yeah. and now we would push the, the part 97 um, authorization. So I would say that that's a really great resource just to get started and you know, get your foot in and uh, start figuring out what directions you need to go. Um, but beyond that, once you've, once you've looked at that um, and you understand, like, um, are you going to be on an amateur band? So if you're a university CubeSat, that's usually the, the best way to go is to, to find an amateur band that'll work. Um, and if you are going to do that, you'll want to get an amateur coordination through the IARU. Um, I think technically, legally, maybe you don't have to, but uh, the FCC is probably going to give you a lot of grief if you don't do that. Um, and they are, so the IARU is, uh, what are they called? The International Amateur Radio Union. Um, and their website is just IARU.org. And they have a lot of great resources on there too for like figuring out your link budgets and stuff. Um, but that organization is essentially, it's a bunch of uh, unpaid volunteers and um, they are essentially the gatekeepers to the amateur frequencies. And so um, they're the ones that are gonna look, you're gonna submit an application to them for coordination and they will look at uh, what your mission objectives are and what type of frequencies you're trying to get and uh, a lot of um, specifics about your, your comm system. And um, if everything looks good to them, they'll coordinate you on a frequency in the, the band that you requested or the frequency you requested. And uh, that's just to avoid interference and to make sure that only appropriate organizations are using the amateur band because it's in the more recent years, we've had a lot of people trying to get in the amateur frequencies that aren't appropriate because, you know, for whatever reason, it's, it's better for them, but it's, uh, it's really clogging up the space. So mm. um, they, uh, they're trying to, um, you know, do a good job of making sure that it's, it's only appropriate people in there and universities are appropriate. You're uh, an educational institution and it's for, mostly educational purposes. So that's that's fine. That's one of the options that you can check on the, the form. Um, so once you have that and uh, biggest piece of advice is get started on that uh, coordination request for the IARU. Uh, basically as soon as you uh, 
God, no, you're doing a CubeSat project. Like I wouldn't wait till you're manifested to start getting that paperwork in order. Um, okay. You might wait till you're manifested to submit it, um, but you definitely want to have have everything ready to go as soon as you're um, manifested so you can submit it because sometimes the IARU takes, you know, two or three weeks to get it back to you. And sometimes I've got an, uh, a CubeSat group right now that uh, I think they initially submitted it like a year ago and they're oh still, gosh. it's gone back and forth a lot. I think the first one they forgot to sign and it's just, um, I'm not sure what's going on, but it's, uh, it's taking a very long time. So usually, usually it's a month or two uh, tops, but uh, you still want to get that in as soon as you can, because you can't do anything with the FCC until that's in hand. Uh, so once you have that, um, then you want to decide if you're part 97 or part five, you know, amateur or experimental. Um, so if you are uh, part 97, um, you definitely want to have someone designated as um, the um, amateur license holder. Uh, so part 97, uh, like I said before, that it is not a license. It's more of an authorization from the FCC. And you're, um, so you're not getting a license for your satellites or your comm system. You are uh, going to be operating it under someone's personal ham license there, their amateur license. And so you definitely need somebody, somebody that's very permanent to your, uh, to your lab staff. Uh, whether it's your professor or, you know, somebody in the community that's uh, volunteering to help, um, that's, uh, that's who's going to need to uh, be on all the paperwork um, and they need a, a proper license to, to file under. And um, there's a bunch of inputs that you need to prepare to send to the, uh, the FCC. Uh, but instead of doing a uh, online application, it's just an email you're going to send to someone. And uh, there, I believe there's uh, uh, guidance out there to explain exactly who you need to send it to and what you need to send. Um, but it's essentially, it's the same types of inputs you need to send for uh, an experimental license. Uh, so you have like a, a mission description, you'll have a debris assessment report. Um, what else? Your space cap, which is no fun to do, um, but that's that's necessary for anything because that's what the ITU needs is your space cap, and um, your your IARU coordination. Um, so all this is listed out in that CubeSat 101 document too. That hasn't changed. Uh, the one thing extra you'll need for the Part 97 authorization is um, one of the requirements for uh, having a Part 97. Uh, operation is nobody in the organization can have what's called a pecuniary interest in the project. So that means they're getting paid. Um, okay. And a lot of people interpret that as meaning um, you're, you're getting paid directly by the university to do this project. Uh, so they think, you know, faculty or anybody else is exempt, but it's really anybody from the university that's getting paid at all by the university. So, um, you know, you've got uh, faculty, if they're involved, they're definitely have a pecuniary interest. Um, but there's a way to get around that. Um, as long as somebody is getting uh, college credit for it, and it can be um, a part of a, a formal course, or it can be independent study or a capstone project, uh, then that uh, pecuniary interest clause goes away and you can you can get around it very easily. It's just a, a letter that says somebody's getting credit. Okay. Um, but that's the major point for part 97 is to make sure you have that uh, letter to get around that. But otherwise it's it's fairly simple. Okay. Um, yeah. And so you can can you get paid and but you can get paid and get credit at the same time, right? Or is that um, how some institutions work? That's not how AS. Well, th that wasn't a thing ASU allowed us to do. Um, so yeah, it's as long as somebody's getting credit, it's it's covered. Oh, so okay. a professor could teach a course on it, and part of that course could be operating the CubeSat, and somebody's getting credit for that part of the course, then it's done. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's so if you've got. got a few people on independent study getting a couple credits and, you know, uh, have their ham licenses, um, you're, you're set. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and that's, okay. And, th and that's good to know that, I guess, for, 
So for the amateur license, like they don't have to fill out form 442 or, or whatever Correct. that is on the, yeah. Okay. So that, that one's just for experimental, I think. Yeah. And so for, yeah, for the part 97, you'll send that email off and mm -hmm. they might ask you some questions or have you uh, do some go backs on your, your inputs. Um, but then they're not going to send you a license. Uh, at some point, they'll send you an email that um, through legal speak, it can be a little hard to decipher, but they're basically saying you're authorized to go. We're, we're sending this on to the ITU, and as far as we're concerned, you're fine. Okay. Uh, so you're just waiting for an email back from someone. Okay. So once, so if you have an amateur license and you get that that email back that says, like, you're good to go, does that mean that you can be launched and and operate at that point, or do you have to wait for that response back from the ITU before your spacecraft is delivered? Yeah, so the ITU actually puts you all of your information up uh, in their registry so that all the other nations can uh, review it and make sure that they're not going to have any interference problems. That's up there for four months, and the FCC doesn't wait for uh, the entire four months. They basically just they review it to their own satisfaction, and then they they shoot it off to the ITU. And then they they approve it for for the the CubeSat developer, so you okay. don't have to wait for the ITU. Okay, so the FCC because so so the IRU kind of manages the the spectrum and tells you okay these are the frequencies where you're not going to interfere with anyone, but the FCC is at least for the the US um, kind of the like acting head of um, you know you you are okay to operate. And then from there, they just pass all the information all along to the ITU. So there's some sort of international organization that's tracking this for every other country that has spacecraft or is, or is utilizing any part of the spectrum. Yeah, the ITU is kind of um, the, the final arbiter of uh, what frequencies are appropriate. And um, as the, the International Telecommunications Union and the U.S., along with pretty much every other country, is a member state in that, and it's you know has to do with you know international treaties and deciding uh, who's going to do what. And uh, so it's all kind of written down a while ago, and there's there's changes here and there, but nothing that really affects us. Um, but that's that's the FCC deals with ITU. We don't directly have to deal with the ITU. Gotcha. Um, I guess to to kind of focus on one. Um, one resource that you mentioned was SpaceCap. Um, and so this, so yeah, because you have SpaceCap and then you have SpaceVal to kind of validate your, like everything that you've, you've entered into SpaceCap before you send it off. Um, so I guess, can you describe those two things a little bit just so that people kind of understand what it is and and why it's uh it's fun to <laughs> to complete um yeah so the itu has put out um some very rudimentary software packages um in order uh to get the information that they need in the exact uh format that they need it in and so anyone who's applying for a license uh needs to do the the space cap which goes along with the space eval and also a gims file um and these are all free programs. Um, they've gone through a lot of uh, revisions and they used to be very difficult to work with. And now they're only just kind of difficult to work with. Um, they have user guides to kind of help you out, but um, it is hard to learn how to use the program. Uh, it's not obvious. And you're just gonna look for as much online help as you can uh, to fill it out the first time if you've never done it before. Um, so it's, it's information like, um, uh, antenna power out and um, your mission type, um, where you're located, where your antennas are located, and if it's if you've got space to ground or space to space. Um, it's just a lot of uh, some technical information, um, some not technical information. They're going to want your your beam patterns for your antennas and things like that. Um, so yeah, the space cap is the the main thing. That's your API file. Um, it's what the, the ITU uses to, uh, to track you and to register you. Uh, so you'll fill out the space cap and uh, then there's, uh, well, when you download the, the space cap, you're actually downloading like their entire suite of programs. Um, it's just easier to do it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do the space cap and then uh, if you have any diagrams that you need to submit, uh, beam diagrams, 
you need to put those in a GIMS file. Uh, so that's another treat to work with. Um, I did a lot of research online and I finally found a PowerPoint presentation that helped me figure out how to do, uh, how to do GIMS. And they do have user guides on the IT website that are, are helpful, but if you have a, a troubleshooting issue, um, you're gonna be uh, doing a lot of uh, internet research. So uh, when you do your space value, you're validating that everything makes sense. You haven't, you don't have any major typos, or you know, you accidentally put in a, a frequency that's outside the frequency band. Um, it'll it'll find any errors that you may have inadvertently made. Um, and it's it's actually it used to be very difficult to work with. Now I think it's it's pretty friendly and it's easier to understand what the errors are. Um, it used to be tough. Um, so when you do your, uh, your validation report, your space eval, um, it takes your, your space cap and your GIMS, and it can look at both of them to make sure they make sense together. Um, and before you send it off to the FCC, uh, you definitely want to do your, your validation with the space eval to make sure uh, you don't have any fatal errors. Um, warnings are okay, but fatal errors, they're going to send it right back to you and say, why do you have a fatal error? Gotcha. And so, so that is something that you send directly to your contact at the FCC. Does it matter who that contact is? Like, is there a, a certain like role you should look for? Or? Um, so when you're doing part 97, you'll have somebody that you're sending it to. It's, um, I think they have a generic account, but then they are also gonna send it to uh, Joseph Hill um, mm -hmm. at the FCC. And so you're gonna send your space cap with everything else there. Um, but if you're doing an experimental license, you have an online application to do and you can't submit it online uh, just because of the format that it's in. So somebody, after you submit your initial application, somebody should contact you and ask for the space cap. And uh, I would just word of warning, if you don't hear back from anybody, you know, four weeks after you submitted your application, definitely, try the, uh, the generic FCC uh, help email um, and just try to try to find out who it is that uh, that's responsible for your license so that you know they might have accidentally put you in the, the back of the line or something. Um, so make sure that uh, they know that what your, uh, what your uh, need by date is and you can get them that space cap um, sooner instead of later. Gotcha. And how long so? How long would you say that this whole process from start to finish normally takes CubeSats? I think it took us like a year to sort everything out, like not having known anything about it and just kind of slowly working through it with everything else. But um, is that pretty typical or it, does it usually happen shorter or longer? Or um, well, COVID, of course, everything got extended and delayed, but uh, typically, um, if you're starting with your IARU and, and you haven't done anything else yet, but you've got your columns basically designed, uh, a year sounds about right. Um, you definitely want to have everything into the FCC, I would say, at least four months before you need it. Um, so, if, you know, your delivery date is um, January 1st, um, you want to do at least four months out before that, um, because you know I don't know how your uh, experience went with licensing, but you uh, if you establish your need date as the delivery date, and then uh, you know you're a week out, and you everybody's starting to kind of freak out that you don't have your license yet. So um, four months plus is uh, best best advice. Gotcha. Um, I had somebody at the actually I did have somebody at the FCC recommend if it's if you've never done a license before um six months before you need it would be best okay i i don't remember when we got ours relative to our delivery date i just remember like what i would do is every so often i i'd email them and go hey our delivery date is is this uh, and you know how's this process going um and i would just kind of poke people <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and eventually one day we we did get the the license. So yeah, there is there is some guidance out there uh, written down. It was a long time ago. Somebody made it, um, and it's they do say uh, ninety days, uh, but there's no guarantee. So even yeah. if they say ninety days or four months or six months, there's never a guarantee. And if you have problems with your paperwork or it wasn't filled out quite right, that's going to cause delays. Um, that being said, um, they will work pretty hard to try and get you by your delivery date. Um, 
uh, we have had some some tight calls and um, you know late starts, and they've they've been pretty understanding. And it kind of depends on who you get to. Um, sometimes they're just overwhelmed with all the work they've got, and they they really can't help you out much. But other times. Um, You'll find some some really uh, helpful people there at the FCC that are going to try really hard to uh, to get you licensed on time and not miss your your launch. Right. Um, I guess to kind of go off of that a little bit, what other tips have you found kind of help move the process along? Whether it be uh, talking to people or um, yeah, I guess <laughs> and the only thing I can think of is talking to people, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that is, that's a really good one. Um, I would say, like, say you're having trouble getting your IARU request reviewed or, you know, it's been a month and what's going on with this. Um, uh, you can uh, you can email the IARU directly, but that may or may not be helpful. Um, sometimes they're responsive, sometimes they're not. Uh, but the IARU satellites page does have a list of uh, contacts that you can reach out to. And uh, a number of those are AMSAT. Um, I think it's two of them. But um, if you reach out to some of those contacts, particularly the AMSAT contacts on that IARU page, um, they'll, they're usually very helpful and they'll figure out what's going on. And um, my, my best advice would be when you do reach out to people, uh, either IARU or FCC, just being very respectful and being uh, polite. Uh, don't, don't, act like you're entitled to this, like, oh, I submitted this eight months ago, where is it? Uh, that it will not help you. Right. <laughs> and then uh, reaching out to AMSAT if you're stuck, um, those guys, uh, they do satellite work as well. Um, and they're they're very friendly and fun to talk to. Um, but yeah, um, just advice is like, stay on top of it. Um, when, after you send your information to the FCC, you know, if you're, um, if you haven't heard from them in a while, um, just reach out and again, you know, respectfully, like, hey, I sent this in, this is my, like you were saying, this is my deadline, uh, does it look good for me, you know, that kind of thing, um, just be friendly and nice and courteous. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's great advice, um, and that's something I can definitely speak to help us a lot, um, with, with our licensing process, because, um, and even when we were doing the IRU form, I, I was filling it out and I was like, you know, I didn't understand this part. I contacted, um, oh shoot, I don't remember if he was our division manager or who, who like what exactly his role was at, at the IRU. Um, but, you know, I, I had several conversations with him back and forth on just what to put in the document, how to word things. Um, and so when we submitted our our IARU coordination letter to Hans, it was like, I think approved right away. We didn't have any changes to make because it had already kind of been vetted. Uh, and, and so that, that helped us quite a bit. Yeah, making sure, uh, particularly that the IARU coordination request, making sure it's complete and accurate and you understand it, which that one is difficult to understand, especially if you're, you're new to the, the mm -hmm. field. Um, so yeah, just asking people, um, yeah, the, uh, those AMSAT guys at the IARU are, are very helpful with, uh, understanding. Nice. Um, and then I guess, so, so you said that you had been mentoring or mentoring, helping other, uh, other student teams who are working on the licensing process. So how do people normally get in touch with you if they get stuck or if they need some additional help? Um. Well, for, for that particularly, I, uh, I also work, I'm a RF licensing consultant, so I get okay. hired by uh, CSLI to, uh, to help with licensing. Um, there's a couple other, at least one other person that uh, also gets hired to do that. Um, so if you're working with CSLI uh, or, you know, you're manifested on a CSLI flight, um, it's somebody like me will be helping you and making sure that your IARU coordination looks good um, and is acceptable. And um, that's uh, that's one way to do it is go through CSLI. Um, another way uh, you can also, if you have any specific questions or you need some guidance, uh, you can contact uh, me through Cal Poly. Um, the email is just cubesat at calpoly.edu, and we take we take all kinds of cubesat questions there. 
um, it's really there for the community to kind of reach out and when there's questions about, you know, the cube set design specification or things mm -hmm. like that. We, yeah, we try to help people out when uh, when that's a little confusing too. Awesome. Um, okay, so to maybe ask, I don't, I don't know if this question is is going to be weird, um, but I do want to ask it. <laughs> um, not to not to you know present like a terrifying intro or anything, but I'm I'm curious to ask if if you've ever been in a situation where like you or a keepset team in the FCC didn't quite agree on how something was licensed or or, or some area of the documentation that you had to complete. Um, maybe this was analysis or or a document the way that you had to complete a certain document. Um, and how did, how exactly did you handle that? And, and how do you, if, if you get stuck in, in maybe a disagreement, what's the right way to kind of handle, uh, conversations back and forth. So that way both sides can kind of come to an agreement on what the best path forward is. And if this is like a weird quote, like we don't have to answer it <laughs> either. If this think, is like a weird I think question. I keep it general. <laughs> I keep it pretty general. Um, okay. That, that does arise where you have a disagreement, like the FCC says you need to do this or that, or mm -hmm. you think that's, you know, according to the, uh, you know, the regulations, um, that that's not correct. Um, I mean, you just have a discussion with them, and uh, you'll go maybe go back and forth uh, with it for a little bit. Uh, but in the end, the the FCC is going to win out, and you're going to you're going to do what the FCC says. But you do have an opportunity to convince them, like, oh, I think I I wouldn't be, you know, um, too forceful about it. But uh, just state your case and why you think you're right, and they'll consider it for sure. Um, they have some good people in the the International Bureau. That's usually where these things crop up, and um, you'll just you'll kind of go back and forth and kind of want to pull your hair out, and then <laughs> in the end. You're just going to go, whatever they decide, you're kind of going to go with. Um, if you are a, a CSLI cube set, uh, you have some other avenues, but usually that's not necessary uh, or warranted. Um, but occasionally, you know, maybe somebody, um, somebody higher up than you uh, in that CSLI program will, will make a call somewhere else and see what they can do. Um, but usually, usually it's something that you can live with. Um, mm. And it's just... Um, they are they are the the final arbiter typically, um, so it's it's fine that they'll work with you as much as they can. But when they they've made the decision, then that's the decision. Gotcha. Yeah, we did we did kind of have well the reason why I was curious to ask is because we did kind of have a situation like that where we were supposed to do it was I believe it was an interference analysis, and that was not something that I think any cubes app before us had had to do. Um, and you know, like we, we would have had to have figured out how to, how to do it or what software we needed or something. And so we ended up having, just having a discussion with, uh, NASA involved as well. Um, kind of going back and forth just to understand like why we needed to do it or why we didn't need to do it. And in the end, we didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to, to do that analysis, but it was something that came up, um, I think just as we were kind of asking about the the licensing process and things that we needed, so. Yeah, yeah, so that is one thing. Um, if, if you're amateur frequency, that uh, amateur coordination from the IARU counts as your uh, interference analysis. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna be on a frequency that's not amateur, you have to do that, um, that uh, report and analysis okay. that says you wanna interfere. And uh, in a case like that, um, a lot, there are some times where the person that you're directly dealing with um, is maybe mistaken or um, they, they haven't dealt with your type of CubeSat or your type mm -hmm. of space before. Um, and a lot of times if you, you make that argument, they'll kick it up to the next level person to ask them uh, to see what's going on. And uh, usually it gets resolved there. Okay. But yeah, I, I can see something like that happening where, where somebody was maybe a little confused on what, what the uh, typical process is. And uh, but usually it works out at a lower level. Uh, I assume uh, that's what happened with, with you guys. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was. I guess kind of going off of that, have there been any like special cases that you've had to deal with regarding like licensing? Like 
you know, maybe, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, um, we've had a few times, well, there's one case that's, I don't know if it's famous, but there was, I, uh, I visited the FCC once when I was in DC and oh. uh, one of the, one of the people there, yeah, I just kind of shook hands and, and met saw faces that I had emailed with, uh, and somebody brought up this uh, licensing situation. Like, weren't you, uh, weren't you this license? And it's, uh, we had, uh, we were helping a, a high school group um, get licensed for uh, just a typical uh, ride share. And um, the, the launch vehicle they were on kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And so their, uh, their launch broker or integrator um, found another slot for them real quick on a, a different launch vehicle that was going in like a couple weeks. Oh. And they're like, oh, we can do this, uh, blah, blah, blah. They, they uh, switched everything over. And then, um, no kidding, the, uh, the FCC called me. I had no idea this was happening. The FCC called me and was like, what's, what's going on here? You're not allowed to um, switch your, your launch vehicle like this. You have to get a, a whole new license. And so I made a bunch of phone calls. And um, so moral of the story was... Um, if you're going to make a change that changes, you know, your, your launch or your orbit, um, you need to do a license mod. So uh, that's going to be 60 days. Mm -hmm. And these guys didn't miss their flight because um, the people responsible for making the change worked really hard and begged and pleaded, mm -hmm. I think. And the FCC did do the license and modification, but I don't think they were very happy about it. And uh, that was uh, definitely a ton of work right away for everybody, um, but but that was very cool of them to get that done for this uh, this high school group that was trying to try to put a cube set up. Mm -hmm. um, There's another time very recently um, we had a disagreement with the FCC, like like you were talking about, but it was a bit higher level. Um, it was you know who is responsible for licensing this quote unquote spacecraft. Um, and in the end, the, the FCC won uh, because the, the spacecraft wasn't really a spacecraft. It didn't actually leave the rocket body. It stayed on the rocket body and uh, performed, a, it was supposed to perform a, a deorbit uh, mechanism. So it put out a, a drag sail. And um, the FCC, we were going to do the, uh, the license for it, but the FCC said the launch vehicle should be responsible for the license for it. And that's just a, a legal determination um, who's liable for it. And so um, the, the launch vehicle didn't want to do it because they were already uh, putting us up there basically for free. Um, so we ended up just not licensing our part of it and uh, we didn't have a transmitter on it. But um, yeah, those, those kind of things where you just don't expect it to be a problem and all of a sudden it's a problem and that's, that can delay your licensing. So that's why you want to be as early as possible with everything. Mm -hmm. no, that's good. And, and that's good too that you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's tied kind of to when you're launching um, because you don't, I, I think you they want to make sure that you're not going to be transmitting on the same frequency as any other CubeSat that's going to be launched at that time. I think that was, <laughs> that actually was something that happened to us. We ended up, um, so we were deployed with another CubeSat that I think was supposed to launch a little bit earlier, but they, their launch got pushed forward and they ended up deploying with us but they were operating on the same amateur frequency as we were. So people were sending us telemetry and like labeling it as Phoenix. And it wasn't technically ours. It belonged to this other CubeSat, but that was like, you know, the one in a million chance of this happening. Um, and, you know, it wasn't something, it wasn't something that anyone tried to purposefully do, but mm -hmm. um I, I think that's that's good that you mentioned that you know if you have a major change in your launch vehicle or or you know anything else major with the spacecraft like the orbit um, like you have to keep the FCC involved in that just as much as you have to keep your launch integrator involved in that process as well because they're they they have to know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I think NanoRacks is tracking that now too. When they uh, mm -hmm. when they release cubes, they uh, they check everybody's uh, frequency to make sure they're not the same at least. Because uh, the IRU didn't used to ask that. Uh, that's a new um, uh, question on the forum that they mm -hmm. actually check. Who are you uh, deploying with so that they can make sure that that's not the same frequency? Um, 
But yeah, if everybody's trying to get on that 437 megahertz, uh, there's more of a chance that you're going to be at least close enough to interfere and get confusion like that. Yeah. Yeah. We ended up having to, um, we got in contact with them luckily beforehand and all we, I think they, they weren't, so their experiment was only supposed to last for a few months and then they were going to, um, because it, I think it was studying reentry specifically, so it wasn't going to be like a long duration or anything. Um, but we did have to get in touch with them and kind of understand that we're both on the same frequency. Um, these are what our nominal operations are going to be compared to yours, and just try to work out, uh, you know, okay, maybe on these days, like we'll transmit, and then you know, you guys will hold off, or you know, we'll just keep in contact and see how it goes. Um, but yeah, that was surprising because we were like we i thought this wasn't supposed to happen <laughs> but yeah, yeah. yeah yep it happens it's, it's tough in the amateur band but yeah to kind of go off of that i guess since we're talking about um you know kind of these these overlapping frequencies as space has exploded and more people are you know playing uh you know entering spacecraft into the amateur bands um how, how, I guess, how, how, um, is that changing things regarding licensing? Like, I think I remember hearing whispers or something at, towards the end of our licensing process that, um, CubeSats were going to be, like, they might schedule two CubeSats on the same frequency just because there was not, there's only so much space in the amateur spectrum, um, or it's something to that degree, but I, I'm not, I know like there's a lot of people who are, you know, that they're working very hard at organizing it and they have a really good process for it, but I'm not sure how that process has changed now that there's so many more people or not people, <laughs> but spacecraft up there. Um, I don't think there's much difference in that. Um, it's, it is common for uh, CubeSats to have the same frequency. It's just that you don't want them to be released at the same point or, you know, have orbits that are similar. Because um, uh, the satellites that Cal Poly sends up, they're pretty much all in the exact same frequency, but, you know, they're nowhere near each other. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not an issue. Um, but yeah, I think it's just, it's going to be common for uh, people to have uh, similar or same frequencies. Um, but, you know, space is very, very big too. Mm -hmm. um, and these, these CubeSats stop working after a couple of years, typically. Um, they're just, you know, they're CubeSats. Um, they, uh, either they're going to uh, deorbit or they're just going to not work. Um, that's very, very common. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't see it being too much of an issue at this point. Um, they are, they did change, I mean, the FCC did make a big uh, rule change uh, for commercial satellites uh, dealing with constellations. Uh, but that shouldn't, uh, I don't think that affected uh, university CubeSats in any significant way. Um, yeah, so I, I think we're okay for the time being. Okay. That's good. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's, I, I feel like that's a common question that I've seen come up like at CubeSat conferences or, you know, panels when anyone's talking about this kind of stuff is because people are, they're, they're curious how um, you know, regula regulations are changing in general as more people are, are entering this game of small spacecraft. Yeah, I would, I would say um, recently we ran into this uh, issue is um, one big change. If uh, um, you have a deorbit device, you know, something, mm -hmm. a drag sail or a drag balloon or something, um, the FCC uh, is also kind of taken on the role of being the, the gatekeeper to, to space. So if they, they have that uh, orbital debris report that they require, make sure that you're, you're following all the orbital debris um, uh, guidelines and requirements. Uh, so we now have the, uh, the added uh, challenge of working around a, the Chinese space station that's mm -hmm. at lower altitude than the, uh, the ISS. Um, there's concerns sometimes, like if you have a deorbit device on board, um, that uh, they want to make sure that you're not going to deploy that above the station uh, or cause any risk to that that other station. Um, so it's it's really important to think about that uh, if if that's something that's part of your mission or part of your uh, 
your CubeSat uh, objectives. Uh, just think about that and um, just make sure you, you again, add more margin into your uh, uh, FCC application time to, to account for anything that might come up last minute uh, or any concerns like that. Anything, you know, if you have propulsion or anything uh, really exciting on board, uh, they're probably going to uh, ask you lots of questions about it and want extra documentation. So um, just be prepared for that. Gotcha. And you mentioned the orbital debris assessment. For NASA, did that for us, is that still the case with a lot of people who launch with like the CSLI or um, is it now like teams have to take care of that themselves as well? Uh, so if you're CSLI, NASA is going to do it. Uh, you just have to, of course, give them the, the information they need to do the analysis, but they'll do the report and the analysis. But if you're not CSLI, you do have to do that report yourself. Um, and it's, it's kind of a pain to use the, the DAS software. Uh, it's free, but it's uh, not very user-friendly the first time you try it. Um, and as far as, you know, knowing what goes in the report or what's required in the report, um, it's, it's really easy to find examples online because, uh, like, when you uh, submit a uh, experimental license application, uh, all of those uh, inputs, your ODAR and your mission description, all that is up uh, online for anybody to, uh, to look at. So uh, I would, my advice, if you have to write your own ODAR, is to um, just Google ODAR, Debris Assessment Report, something like that, and it'll pop right up with like lots and lots of hits. You can also go to uh, NASA's OET website where you uh, submit your uh, experimental license application, and there's a, an option to search uh, licenses, and you can uh, you can uh, refine your search and find all the the CubeSats in the past couple of years. Oh, that's really that's cool. A, yeah, that's a great way to uh, benefit from somebody else's work. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I remember because like before we knew that NASA was going to do it for us, like we tried to do it, and I think I only found one paper on it. So it's it's awesome that there are actually resources um, and and more of these out there for you to just go and look at. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, otherwise, yeah, you just don't know what's required in this report. They just say you need the report. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. I need this report. What exactly is this? Okay, <laughs> let's let's figure this out. <laughs> I think that's how a lot of uh, a lot of CubeSat development goes in general. <laughs> right, so there's another question in my head, and I don't remember what it was. Uh, we'll come back to me in like six hours when I can't think of it anymore. <laughs> Um, so I guess as a, as a last question, and this is the, you know, the question I, I just like to ask everyone, um, for fun. Um, but you know, what is, what is a favorite memory that you have from, you know, working with licensing all these years, or, you know, maybe just a memory that, you know, is, is just really meaningful, you meaningful, you meaningful for you to look back on, um, you know, re regarding mm -hmm. everything. <laughs> Um, that is a tough one. Uh, honestly, um, a memory that I have that I keep going back to because I think it was so cool. Um, it's not a very old memory. It's from our uh, CubeSat Developers Workshop uh, last year. It was virtual, uh, so it was free to attend, and we had um, a lot of people asking questions. Uh, we had these virtual uh, exhibit booths, so um, I was uh, I was running the Cal Poly exhibit booth, and we got a lot of questions. Just basically, you know, how do I do a CubeSat? Uh, very basic questions. And I was talking to people from Morocco, and I, I remember talking to, I think she was uh, in her bedroom in Poland or something, and she had all these really intelligent questions about uh, the CubeSat design specification, and I just thought it was so awesome that I could uh, talk to these people in their own home countries, and we're still just talking about CubeSats and um, helping them out, and they're, they're super excited about it, um, really just uh, kind of brings home the, uh, the worldwide aspect of, uh, of uh, CubeSats and getting everybody involved and getting everybody excited about STEM and space. Um, so currently that's my favorite memory. Uh, it's my, my, one of my more recent ones, so it's easier to uh, call up. But uh, yeah, that was, doesn't have much to do with licensing, but uh, I just really like CubeSats and uh, what, it, what it does for uh, the world of, of STEM and getting everybody involved. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's... Um... It has been really cool to to see, you know, even just like going to small set, you see all of these um, new people from uh, 
places all over the world and they're working on their own CubeSat and whether it gets manifested or not, they're still trying to go through the whole uh, process of how do we design this? How do we make it something that's like feasible? And it's actually something that people can really feel like they can really get their hands on as opposed to like, um, like for, for our capstone at ASU, we had to design like a, a larger spacecraft, which is harder because we can't just go look at the, the specs of um, a lot of the, you know, the hardware that's on like the Europa Clipper or something uh, mm. just online. Like you, you don't have those documents, um, but it's, you know, people get so creative with these CubeSat ideas and just trying to make something that's really like cost effective, but you know, complete some sort of scientific mission or, um, or other type of experiment that they, they want to. Um, so it's, it's, it's been cool to, to see people get really excited about it in that way. Cause I think be before this, people just felt like space was very far away for them at the undergraduate level. Like I'll never really get to touch anything until I'm actually in the industry working on all of this. So um, I know at least that's that's definitely how it felt for us working on Phoenix as undergraduates. Yeah, definitely. So many awesome opportunities. And then, yeah, now it's high schools and even junior high kids are getting into it. So mm -hmm. it's open to everybody. Yeah. Um, actually, okay, I do have one question. <laughs> um, so the ITU has a cost recovery form that, uh, yeah. Yeah, that people have to fill out. Um, how, um, not too sure how to ask this question, but like how, what's the right way to approach this? Cause I know like when you read the letter, there's no, well, a dollar amount attached to it. Yeah. So maybe, okay. So maybe this is a two-part question of, um, you know, do people normally actually try to calculate what they would, you know, or maybe we should back, we should probably back up more and explain what the, what the ITU cost recovery letter is, and then yeah. um, uh, whether you know do do people actually calculate what they're supposed to to pay on it, um, or yeah. do they just kind of? Yeah. So um, if you're uh, Part ninety seven, I don't think you have to do that. Uh, but okay. if you're experimental. Um, the ITU you know, basically reserves the right to recoup their processing fees. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, but the FCC gives you a form letter, uh, the template, you basically fill in your name uh, and some, you know, what your satellite is, that kind of thing, and sign it. Um, so somebody at your university that's responsible for the money uh, side of it has to sign it. So it's, it's probably not the professor. It's probably mm -hmm. somebody, somebody high up in contracts or uh, grants development or whatever it is at your university they'll sign it and there's no dollar amount assigned to it. So uh, there are some universities that they don't refuse to sign it, but man, it's, it's tough to get them to sign it because you don't know if it's, is it $10 or a million dollars? I don't know. Um, and I don't know if it actually says anywhere in, um, you know, if the ITU has this uh, listed on some web page somewhere, uh, I haven't seen it. Um, but I can tell you that uh, Cal Poly has been charged a handful of times for it and mm -hmm. Each time, I think it's been uh, 570 Swiss francs, which okay. is around you know 600 ish dollars. Um, so it's it's a fee. It's not nothing, but it's it's not scary. It's not it's not you know 10 million dollars or something like that. Right. Um, so um, I think some universities are still going to be uh, not wanting to to sign it just in case. Um, but you know, uh, the FCC does require you to uh, to have that letter and sign it. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's tough to figure out who's going to sign it and who's going to you know, put their life on the line. But um, <laughs> I, I can tell you, it is it is a reasonable sum. It's not crazy. Okay. Is are there? Um, I guess you know the handful of times that you guys did have to pay that fee. Were there um, guidelines around like like? why you had to pay it or, or not guidelines, but circumstances around like why you had to pay it one time and not another? Not that I'm aware of it. Um, I don't know if it's something like they had to do some extra review mm -hmm. or you know, maybe it's just that they didn't track it before and now they're kind of tight on money. So they track it better now. Um, that can happen with any organization. Um, so I think, 
I think it's maybe just got to do with um, them being a little more careful with their bookkeeping and uh, uh, recovering some fees when they need to. Um, but it, it might also have to do with, you know, how many go backs do they do or did they did they have to ask extra questions or did somebody have to spend extra time on it? Um, so I don't know is the, the short answer, um, but there, there's lots of things that it could be uh, and it could be could just be random. OK, yeah, I remember. I remember see, like getting that when we were doing ours for Phoenix and, um, you know, like we went through, you know, the, the whole fact that it was just kind of this nebulous, like you will agree to pay a fee and we don't know what that fee is. Um, but you may have to pay this. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, at the time NASA had told us that, you know, that this is more, this, this form is, it's really more for like, I, I think like contractual, um, or, you know, just, just kind of having like all of the loose ends tied up. Um, and that typically CubeSats didn't have to, they like you, typically universities weren't charged for it. Um, but that, you know, we had to fill it out. It, it was important for us to fill it out to kind of secure all of our loose ends. And we were trying to get ASU to do that. And it was, it did get passed up to like the contracts side of things and they, you know, they, they didn't really like um, the fact that they had to sign kind of this nebulous document. So that was interesting for us. Um, yeah, to... legally, it's, it's basically a blank check mm -hmm. legally. Yeah, you don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. And since Phoenix was like the first CubeSat that ASU had, had really done like that, they were like, we've, you know, we've never seen this before. This is yeah, you know, this is really weird and we don't know how we feel about this. Um, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't smooth, <laughs> but yeah yeah. 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 The university has its own lawyers and they're just telling them not to sign it, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so hopefully some uh, common sense person will prevail and, and just get it done. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's all of my like, those are all of my major questions, I, I guess, on FCC licensing. And I, I think this really gave a, a very good overview of what everything is and what what things are useful for people. Um, yeah, <laughs> when, you know, when, when they may not know what to do or, or how to navigate anything. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, good. Um, yeah, hopefully it, it helps some people out, um, get some good starting points at least. Um, and yeah, if if it's a CSLA keep set there, they should be set at least uh, for a single transmitter. Um, yeah. Nice. Uh, and I guess uh, maybe one thing that, that I should insert here before I forget about it um, is, you know, is, is NASA usually pretty involved in your licensing process too. I found that, you know, keeping NASA up to date uh, regularly as, as the licensing process went, went through kind of helped things come together more efficiently. Cause you know, with that, we'd mentioned like, oh, you know, the F we were having this conversation with the FCC. And then um, I think that's what, like we mentioned the interference analysis, for example. And that's when they were like, well, you know, usually you're not supposed to do that. And it, we should probably talk to them about that. So I, I found that that was one thing that helped us out a lot um, with helping make sure that the whole process was efficient and that we got it done on time was was keeping us up to date with exactly what the, the conversations with the FCC were. Um, I don't know if you guys have found something similar. Yeah, um, if something, if there's a snag that we run into mm -hmm. for sure, um, Scott Hagenbotham for um, specifically is uh, very knowledgeable about it and he knows the right people. Um, but uh, once once he retires, I think um, the, the people taking his place will also have that knowledge as well. Um, maybe not the many years of experience that uh, Scott has, but uh, they're still uh, they're still in a good place to help everybody out. Um, and they know who to contact and uh, how to resolve these things. Right. So it is good to keep them in the loop and definitely whenever you have a question or some some snag that seems not right to you, um, they're, they're going to be helpful. Right. Awesome. <laughs> um, no, and thank you for adding that too. Um, I think that 
you know, that keeping, what am I trying to say? <laughs> NASA was definitely a really good, you know, kind of authority to have, cause you know, we didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. So we, we would have just kind of done anything <laughs> and been super lost, um, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, having those resources to know basically just who to poke and who to ask, mm -hmm. about, that's that's huge. Um, better better than knowing all the regulations by heart is just knowing whose email you need to reach out to. Right, <laughs> for sure. Um, but yeah, um, I you know I, I want to be respectful of your time, but thank you so so much for doing this with me. I, I really appreciate it, uh, and you know this this conversation was awesome. So I'm, I'm excited to post this and I'm excited for, uh, you know, people to, to benefit off of it as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I hope so. And, uh, yeah, and people can reach out to the, the Cal Poly email or, uh, definitely check out the CubeSat 101 doc. It's, it's written very, in very plain English. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's useful. that's all for this week's episode of the art of space engineering thank you all again for your support on this podcast this is a side project of mine and it's really my way of just trying to give something back to the aerospace community so i hope you all found this interview as insightful and enjoyable as i did i will mention here that to anyone working on a license of their own i have put a few resources on the phoenix website that go over how we completed some of our licensing materials uh, and this includes spacecap and our iaru application form I have a link to that in the episode description, so feel free to look those over if you are interested. I try to make new episodes of this podcast as often as I can and make content shared on here as useful to you as I possibly can. So if you have any questions, comments, or ideas about future episodes, please feel free to connect with me via email or LinkedIn. You can find both of those resources in the podcast description. If you've been enjoying this podcast and you want to support it, please share these episodes with your friends who might be interested in them. And don't forget to follow this on your favorite podcast source and on Facebook to get notifications on upcoming episodes. Here's looking forward to future adventures and the lessons learned from them. Cheers, Sarah. <laughs>